Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Espensky by Maurice Nicole Book 1 The Difference Between Observation and Self-Observation Birdlip, July 24, 1941 To observe and to observe oneself are two different things. Both need attention, but in observation the attention is directed outward through the senses. In self-observation, the attention is directed inwards, and there is no sense organ for this. This is one reason why self-observation is more difficult than observation. In modern science, only the observable is taken as real. Whatever cannot be a matter of observation by the senses, or by the senses aided by telescopes, microscopes, and other delicate optical, electrical, and chemical instruments, is discarded. It has been sometimes stated that one of the general aims of this work is to unite the science of the West with the wisdom of the East. Now, if we define the starting point of Western science on its practical side as the observable, how can we define the starting point of the work? We can define the starting point of the work as the self-observable. It begins on the practical side with self-observation. These two starting points lead in entirely different directions. A man may spend his whole life in observing the phenomenal world, the stars, atoms, cells, and so on. He may gain a great amount of this kind of knowledge, namely knowledge of the external world, that is, of all that aspect of the universe that can be detected by the senses, aided or not. This is one kind of knowledge, and by means of it, changes can be made. The changes are in the external world. Outer, sense-experienced conditions may be improved. All sorts of facilities and conveniences and easier methods may be invented. All this knowledge, if it were used in the right way, could only be for the benefit of mankind by changing his external environment to his advantage. But this kind of knowledge of the external can only change the external. It cannot change a man in himself. The kind of knowledge that can change a man internally cannot be gained merely by means of observation. It does not lie in this direction, that is, in the direction of the outwardly turned senses. There is another kind of knowledge possible to man, and this knowledge begins by self-observation. This kind of knowledge is not gained through the senses, for as was said, we do not possess any organ of sense that can be turned inwards, and by means of which we can observe ourselves as easily as we observe a table or a house. While the first kind of knowledge can change the external conditions of life for a man, the second kind of knowledge can change the man himself. Observation is a means of world change, so to speak. Self-observation is a means of self-change. But although this is so, in order to learn anything, we have to start from knowledge itself, and knowledge of whatever kind begins from the senses. The knowledge of this system of teaching begins with hearing it, that is, it begins through the senses. A man must be told to observe himself, and in which direction he must observe himself, and the reasons why he should observe himself, etc., and whatever he hears or reads in this connection, first of all, must enter through his senses. From this point of view, the kind of knowledge of which the work speaks begins from the plane of the observable, just as does the teaching of any science. A man must begin by giving external attention to the work. He must observe what is said, what he can read of it, and so on. In other words, the work touches the plane of the senses. For this reason, it can very easily become mixed up with the kind of knowledge that can only come through the study of what the senses show, and as it were, lie alongside it, or become stifled by it. And unless a man has the power of distinguishing the nature or quality of the knowledge taught by this work, and the knowledge taught by science, that is, unless he has magnetic center in him, which can differentiate the qualities of knowledge, this mixing up of two planes or orders of knowledge will produce a confusion in him, and this confusion will remain even though a person continues in the work, 
unless some effort is made to let the work pass on to where it belongs in himself. That is, he will judge of the work only by what he sees, by other people outside him, and so on. The work will remain, so to speak, on the level of the senses. What then is the nature of the effort a person must make in this connection? He must effect a separation in his mind between two orders of reality that meet in him. Man stands between two worlds, an external visible world that enters the senses and is shared by everyone, and an internal world that none of his senses meet, which is shared by no one. That is, the approach to it is uniquely individual, for although the people in the world can observe you, only you can observe yourself. This internal world is the second reality, and is invisible. If you doubt that this second reality exists, ask yourself the question, Are my thoughts, feelings, sensations, my fears, hopes, disappointments, my joys, my desires, my sorrows real to me? If, of course, you say that they are not real, and that only the table and the house that you can see with your outer eyes are real, then self-observation will have no meaning to you. Let me ask you, in which world of reality do you live and have your being? In the world outside you, revealed by your senses, or in the world that no one sees, and only you can observe, this inner world? I think you will agree that it is in this inner world that you really live all the time, and feel, and suffer. Now both worlds are verifiable experimentally, the outer observable world and the inner self-observable world. You can prove things in the outer world, and you can prove things in the inner world, in the one case by observation and in the second case by self-observation. In regard to the second case, all that this work teaches about what you must notice and perceive internally can be verified by self-observation. And the more you open up this inner world called oneself, the more will you understand that you live in two worlds, in two realities, in two environments, outer and inner, and that just as you must learn about the outer world that is observable, how to walk in it, how not to fall off precipices or wander into morasses, how not to associate with evil people, not to eat poison, and so on, by means of this work and its application, you will begin to learn how to walk in this inner world, which is opened up by means of self-observation. Let us take an example of these two different realities to which quite different forms of truth belong. Let us suppose a person is at a dinner party. All that he sees, hears, tastes, smells, and touches belongs to the first reality. All that he thinks and feels, likes, dislikes, etc., belongs to the second reality. He attends two dinner parties, recorded differently, one outer, one inner. All our experiences are the same in this way. There is the outer experience and our inner reaction to it. Which is most real? Which record, in short, forms our personal lives? The outer or the inner reality? Is it true to say that it is the inner world? It is the inner world in which we rise and fall, and in which we continually sway to and fro, and are tossed about, in which we are infested by swarms of negative thoughts and moods, in which we lose everything and spoil everything, and in which we stagger about and fall, without understanding even that there is an inner world in which we are living all the time. This inner world we can only get to know by self-observation, then, and only then, can we begin to grasp that all our lives we have been making an extraordinary mistake. All that we have taken as oneself really opens into a world. In this world we have first to learn how to see, and for this purpose light is necessary. It is by means of self-observation that this light is acquired. Let us represent the matter in the following diagram. Diagrams are useful because one can easily remember them, and so they can act as a means of recalling ideas. 
As regards the internal world, what blocks our contact with it is all that this work teaches that we must struggle with, false personality, and so on. All these wrong things in ourselves form, as it were, a thick cloud that prevents us from right contact with the influences reaching us from the internal world. When the work forms a definitive point or organism in use, it begins to make a relation to the internal world. This I call a church for the moment. It is comparable to what we have to form towards outer life, namely what I call here a fort. This is added owing to the conversation that ensued after the above paper was read at the meeting on Saturday last at Birdlip. The most important thing to grasp is that we live in two different realities or worlds, one shown by the senses, the other only revealed through work on oneself, through the purification of the emotions from false personality and the right ordering of the mind through the ideas of the work, so that relative thinking is made possible and a proper system of thought is built up.